Welcome to the Silicon Slopes Conversations. I'm here with Andy Stroman and Bruce Majors, who are the co-owners of Grand Trunk. How are you guys? Good. Doing good, thanks. Thanks for taking the time to join. And uh, let's just start with, uh, what is Grand Trunk? Um, Grand Trunk is a 20-year-old outdoor specialty company. We sell outdoor gear um, to retailers, online, Amazon. Anything to add to that one, Bruce? Yeah, um, just you know, a, a great brand uh, that sells products that help you go outside and be on an adventure. And we've owned it for uh, about a year and a half, and we brought it to Utah last, last July. Perfect. And you guys both have experience in previous endeavors in the outdoor industry. What was yours, Bruce? Yeah, so I worked for a company called BikeWagon.com that was a, a bicycle retailer for 10 years. Uh, and we were acquired by, so that was in Salt Lake, we were acquired by a, a, a ski and outdoor company called Level 9 Sports. So that was, that was my outdoor experience. Very cool. And Andy was camp saver, right? Yeah, outdoor retail up in Logan um, for about 15 years. And we had a relationship with Grand Trunk um, through those years. So I knew them from before. Uh, so Grand Trunk was out of Illinois, is that correct? All right, so in this industry, um, I think people would be interested in the, uh, the courtship of you know, acquiring and building uh, companies acquiring other platforms. How did this deal uh, come together with whatever comfort level you're, you're able to share? Well, me and um, Dale, the other partner, we had been thinking about doing some, something together for a while and just kept our eyes open. And we actually were, we've analyzed like dozens of deals. And this one came up because it was actually, um, the category of hammocks actually kind of imploded in about 2015 because of Amazon it became a commodity. So that, $70 hammock became like a $30 hammock in about three or four years. And so we don't really want to sell hammocks as like our main business, but that's what it was. But the foundation that they had built was pretty good. Like it looked really good. They had distribution, sales were down significantly, but the bones were there. We'd both like already built the company from the ground up and we didn't want to do that again. And you know, as I've it's just easier to start from like a built foundation to start again. So that's what we're looking for. This company is going, um, it's probably going to go out of business at that point in time. We hear about it. We start talking to them, understanding like, you know, what they're doing. And they actually didn't have that many options. We were very fortunate to talk to them when we did. It was like in the 11th hour of another deal. And we came in with like a better option, not only for, well, it was for the owner and for one of their investors to, and, and one of our goals was for them to get their money back. So the courtship was, was they needed money, the bank was knocking and um, as a solution and, and we, we were there. And it happened quite quickly actually within probably a couple months that they were gonna go with this other company and it flipped over to us. And I think one thing they liked about it was uh, we, the vision, like we don't anticipate growing like a, a good, you know, 10, $20 million business. We, we, d we did that, so we're really interested in like what's next. So that's what the courtship was. Um, and right now, fortunately, the, one of the owners, he, uh, he works for us still, which has been a, good, a big asset, and um, we're on good terms. And we moved it from Chicago to Utah two months after we acquired it. Got it. And Bruce, you mentioned you're more on the operations side, which in my experience with mergers and acquisitions is not the funnest side because you're going to be verifying inventory and kind of in the weeds with like, logistics and moves and equipment and uh, supply chain. How did that go for you? Uh, yeah, I, I guess one thing that was good is I kind of knew what to expect. Yeah, we changed our ERP system. I was the accountant for a little bit, you know, at the very beginning. <laughs> um, but yeah, just kind of getting our ducks in a row. Um, one comment that Andy made just with like reselling SKUs and having tens of thousands and being a retailer, on the flip side of just that, you know, what that monster is, having, a, you know, your own manufactured product that's your SKU and it's the SKU count small and being able to control a lot of those things was much better than previous experience. But yeah, you know, just kind of getting our, our team set the first, you know, six months to a year and getting familiar with the new ERP and everything was kind of, yeah, it was a, it was a mess, you know, in the supply chain world we're currently in and just all those other factors. But yeah, things And, are. you know, I did the, I did Camp Saver for my dorm and did the whole thing for 20 years, right? Had some employees and stuff that definitely helped me and, and I want to, 
recognize their contribution to the company, but it really it was on my shoulders. Loans, personal guarantees, all that kind of thing. Um, this next time I just wasn't interested in like doing it alone again. I had done the late nights and I was in Utah County at this point, I'm in, I'm in Highland, and my business was in Logan, so all my friends, all my contacts were up there. Um, Dale and Bruce provide a ton of relationships, a ton of people, his business was right here, so when we acquired the company, he reached out to people that he worked with that were amazing, and he brought them on the team. People we knew were gonna be there for a long time, people that were interested in the relationship, that were not just looking for a job, and so it's been, much better experience for me like, to partner than take on all this responsibility. I did not want to um, like, jump into like, all the operational stuff and the marketing and the buying and the finance. It, just, it was just too much at that point. So I couldn't be more pleased like, have to partnering and sharing this load with other people. Um, yeah, it's, the been, same, it's been amazing. The same shared value just with Andy was talking about with, with the acquisition, right? The, the seller looked at kind of our vision and that aligned with what they wanted. So I think the team we've built as well to speak to what Andy just said, you know, they, could, they bought into, you know, having that expanded outdoor brand that we're, you know, our vision that we're looking to make Grand Trunk. And yeah, we've, we've built a good team in the last year. Got it. All right, so you, you get your ducks in a row, you get through the, the merger and acquisition part, get everything aligned. Um, how do you guys at that point strategically think through the next steps? Because you obviously went into it with a vision. Ideas have been percolating. Um, where do you guys decide to tackle based on resources and assets versus where you want to be in a year, two years, three years? How do you guys decide strategic vision? So um, we bought the company out of bankruptcy, um, or almost in bankruptcy. If there's a reason the company's in bankruptcy, then clearly there's some problems going on there. And the big problem was product. The product had been commoditized on Amazon and um, the consumers chose that they weren't gonna pay premium dollar for like a hammock or the other products. So clearly that problem still exists when we buy the company. So the first step, first order of business is let's change this product mix. There's no reason to think that this hammock business is gonna come back like it did before. It actually did do really well during COVID, like all outdoor stuff did, but it's not, it's not a viable category with like unlimited growth. So we immediately set to like, let's figure out product first. And this is during COVID, I, you know, we probably took it a little bit slower than we needed to because we had no idea what was going on. So we're writing, we had no inventory. We did a little bit from the company. So we're, we're bringing in inventory. We had retailers. All of a sudden, it starts, it starts ticking up. We're buying the same stuff. And then we're thinking, how do we ride this wave? But also when the wave stops, like there better be somewhere to land. So product is like the big piece that's missing. It has been missing from the company. So we would jump into product. OK, so product is where you guys landed on you need more of. And um, once you've landed on that, how do you decide um, on the rollout? And what, you know, what's the next product? How far ahead out do you guys get with these ideas? So I think the first, the first hurdle was just like the hammocks. Like everyone's like, you're the hammock company with this other company. And we wanna change that conversation to where we're not the hammock company anymore. They can have the hammock category. Um, we'll sell hammocks for now, but get over that hump. So the, this spring or this summer, if things come in, uh, we're talking like doubling our product count and none of it's hammocks. It's all unique new product. So that's like the first step. And then convincing retailers to buy that kind of stuff. That was, the, I guess, the first, the first hurdle. And if we can change that conversation of who we are, then the sky is kind of the limit at that point. Once the customer trusts you with like, getting into their, their backpack or in their home or whatever, then you can kind of just start adding on from there. In the past, we had to rely on retailers to buy stuff from us, and they still come to us and say, hey, we're, we're not, you know, stay in your lane and sell us what you do best. Um, but online, we can sell it wherever we want. So, you know, it it's, doesn't end it the next product category, which is still what we consider hard goods, it's how do, we, how, do we have, how do we have consumers fall in love with our product and then start introducing them other things that they love, like, like this kind of stuff. Everything I'm wearing right now is from the outdoor industry. It's a lifestyle. Like, I, don't, I shop at REI and Prana and things like that, so there's a consumer out there that's just wearing this. How do we become a part of that conversation. And it's like, that's the ultimate goal, is not to be a product company, but become a lifestyle company, a trusted lifestyle company. And we're not trailblazing here. I mean, it's been done before. Um, I think we have some unique ideas and stuff, but that's the, I mean, that's the, that's the cathedral that we want to build. You know, we, we did this small business before, so 
Uh, although great and fun, um, not, not the goal. We bought a company called Alight, which um, had some amazing product developers uh, out of California, developing for the North Face and developing for all kinds of outdoor companies. And they had a company called Alight that was, had great products but, and didn't run the business in a way that made them profitable. So we bought that company. And fortunately, we got with that company to work with this team. So they're the ones kind of doing it for us. It's a lot more difficult. Um, when I say it's easy to make products in China, um, it's easy to make generic product, but to make really amazing stuff, then an engineer has to be involved with that. And that's where they come in and like kind of polish it off for us. So we can conceptualize just about anything, but to polish it, make it special, um, they come in and, and they have great concepts too, but, and kind of polished off for us. So that's been the, the current strategy. I think moving forward, the ideal is like a vertical integration, integrated company. Everybody's sitting under the same roof, talking together um, at the water cooler, like ideas traveling, but right now it's, um, it's outsourced to those guys. Got it. And uh, generally vertically integrated companies are either very old and have been built over time or they've grown through acquisitions. And I'm getting the drift that you guys are uh, gonna grow through acquisitions as well. Is that correct? I mean, yeah, we're looking to other companies that, that fit that and you know, f fill that need as well. So yeah, it's something we're looking to do. Like Andy was saying, you know, clawing and scratching from the bottom you know, to the, to the top and something that we've all kind of done is not ideal, not where we want to get back to. And so, you know, just like Grand Trunk, there was this good platform to, to grow from already. And so, yeah, adding additional brands is something we're looking to do. You know, in the outdoor industry, there's probably a thousand brands out there. Um, I, I probably had relationships with 500 or so. But what you would see if you've been to the trade shows, there's like a tent out there called the, I used to call the um, like Hall of Rejects because in the Renaissance, there was this hall of art that they would throw like all the, like the new guys that weren't classical painters out there, like, like the Van Goghs and stuff. And I could be wrong on the story a little bit, but <laughs> vaguely from my art class, I'm an art major. Um, anyways, interesting products out there in the tents and inventors mostly. And a lot of times these inventors can make great things, but they have a hard time like executing on the entire scope of the company. And so finding these unique products or great designs or something that has reason to live and then helping them get to the next level, I mean, that's what we're interested in, finding at least new and up-and-comers and just kind of lending a hand. We, you know, one of our values of our company is helping not only ourselves grow, but if we can partner with people and help them grow and help them build up, we're great with that. Like, we're totally fine having other people on the team, um, bringing people into the fold, giving up equity. We have no problems with that. Uh, and it's one of the tenets of our company. Like how do we enrich the lives of our employees and our partners, not only like with their jobs, but like how do we help them grow like financially too? So um, we've got like two on the horizon right now that, that are great companies. Um, they look good, they've got great products, but they just need to partner with somebody that can help them like get to the next, the next stage. So that'll always be interesting to us. We'll do the new, the new products too. Um, but the goal isn't, the goal is like how do we build something special? We've done this before, Dale's done it, Bruce did it. Um, I, I made that mistake at Camp Saver. I was always, it, it, there was not like this, this great vision of like, how do we get to this huge company and then when we're huge we can, we can do amazing things. It was just kind of like growing the company. Um, I think I should have had that vision beforehand and I could have you know, ended up a little bit differently. All right, so what method do you guys use? You mentioned you, you know, a thousand brands out there. You've got strong relationships over the years with half of those. Um, you know, there's opportunistic buying where you know the company's hasn't done well and executed well and you can come in and then there's like they've done well and you pay a premium on various multiples what method do you guys use is it <clears throat> opportunistic just based on what's out there or do you go in with a definitive like we'd like to build our product line out to look like this in 2023 here's like 10 companies because it takes a while to do these deals how do you guys go about it uh, yeah i mean i think it needs to fit into that overall vision and the direction, you know, something that complements Grand Trunk as we grow out. Um, but yeah, like Andy said, you know, there's lots of great product out there and that's been created and companies that haven't, you know, for whatever reason, you know, the manufacturing, the, the marketing, the, just the, the fulfillment piece even, and just the, the struggles that, that you have in running a business, you know, from 
start to, to finish with the, getting it to the customer. And, you know, I, I think with kind of both opportunities that come up and look, look good, you know, we're, we're interested in, but also fitting it in that vision of, of Grand Trunk and exploring getting out, being on the road, being adventurous. And we've looked at a bunch of companies since then, and some of them just don't fit the mold because if, we, if we're trying to build this cathedral and do something amazing, um, the company has to have a market or a product that has that potential to grow. So there's a lot of uh, niche products out there that probably don't have the ability to kind of ex expand our bubble. So we're looking for products that have some blue sky opportunity ahead of them um, that, kind of, that we're also passionate about. So we've, we've passed on a bunch that, w that have done well, but they just, we don't love the product, um, and it's not about making the money for us, so we just kind of pass on those for now. So um, the A-Light company was a, an amazing adjacent category to hammocks, and it fits right in. So it's actually not, the A-Light company is not a, set, a standalone entity. It's not its own brand. It's going to be all folded into Grand Trunk because it fit. But these other couple we're looking at will actually stand alone by themselves. So it would be more of a house of brands or a collective with different categories. Um, I ran multiple websites in the past. It's, it's a lot of work. So having distinct contrast between like categories and brands is important to us. Um, but just having that ability to say, well, if this company can do uh, half a million now, it better be able to do you know, 30 million in the future. Otherwise, it probably um, would just, just uh, distract us from our, our goals. All right, I have a few more questions, then we're going to open it up for uh, Q&A from the audience. So if you've ever had questions about how to grow an outdoor retail brand and how it all works, uh, get your questions ready and we'll, uh, we'll field three or four of those. Um, okay, so if, uh, finding good brands, good fits that have scalability, um, oftentimes that requires kind of a capital injection for the parent company, in this case Grand Trunk. Are you guys... Uh, thinking of fundraising, how are you guys going to augment this growth? Yeah, we self-fund right now, um, but for the goals we have, I don't think that's sustainable. So we, you know, when Grand Trunk was first acquired, it didn't look very good. We sold hammocks in a declining industry with declining customers. So we had kind of this plan of like, okay, what does that ideal customer look like where someone could be interested in it, kind of planned it out and talked about it then. And it's kind of coming to fruition now, um, where we have multiple brands, had a couple acquisitions, and things look a little bit different, you know. So looking at possibly raising some money um, to, to finance that, because we're in a much better position to do that. We had a great year, and COVID has been really kind to us, notwithstanding, you know, it has been not so good for some people, but for the outdoor industry, it's been really good. Um, so building off that, and then we're kind of just ready. Like, We've been preparing for the ball for the last year and a half, and I think we're kind of at a point where we're, like, we're ready to go, all dressed up. So. Got it. Anything to add on that one? No, I mean, yeah, just the, you know, the preparation, just to get, to get ready to do that. It's kind of coming in line with the, pro, you know, the vision we originally had when we bought Grand Trunk. And are you guys doing this like internally, or do you have like bankers or outside help as you kind of do these and these, source these deals? Um, yeah, I mean, so we have a few contacts, and we're just still kind of yeah, exploring, just bootstrap things. We're like exploring <laughs> and looking. Yeah, pretty, um, pretty cheap. So <laughs> yeah. we we do it as easy as possible, and try not to get in like rabbit holes of like that kind of thing. And it's, um, but maybe we're doing it the wrong way. That's just where we kind of came from. There's probably a whole other level that we probably aren't comfortable with that we should probably like get involved with. I think as as a, as you get into more money, that comes becomes more important. Um, we're just not to that level of money quite yet that we need, so. Yeah, and what's the, uh, like you, you do an acquisition, it's a good fit, everyone's happy. Um, what's kind of the turnaround time for like the onboarding and getting it all uh, solidified and then like throwing it into what you guys currently have and branding it and communicating it and then ultimately selling it? How long does that take on average? Well, yeah, good question. You know, so I guess, with the few that we're looking at, you know, they're pretty ready to go. Um, you know, one problem that luckily we're not as affected as certain industries, but just the, the lead time in the world we're in with supply chain getting product. You know, so we acquired A-Lite last, uh, I guess, in April of this year. And the earliest we could get was a year later, right? Just, and that was pretty good compared to other things that people are seeing. 
you know, like the discussion we were having earlier. And, you know, coming from the bike industry, talking to some, uh, you know, people that we know in there, just, yeah, it's, it's insane. There's long lead times, manufacturing's backed up. Um, so yeah, just, you know, depending on if, how close it is from, you know, to conception or if they're ready to go with a product, you know, it's just those, those last final barriers. Yeah. And if you had a million dollars to summarize like these supply chain issues concisely, what would it be like? Is it the factories? Is it the shipping? Like what is throwing all these monkey wrenches in the supply chain, at least for your guys' industry? Uh, so, I mean, we, we've been lucky with the fact that we work with some good manufacturers, you know, key partners. Um, just a, a quick story, right? So getting a 40-foot 40, 40 container of these hammock stands that are really popular for us, you know, so I just kind of closed one up last week, and it was six times the cost, <laughs> what it was from the first one we brought over, right? And so, uh, yeah, just the congestion, um, you know, we, we stocked well, we prepared well for this year where some other people didn't, right? So we, I think we had good foresight to, to bring in product um, and the delays weren't as bad as they could have been. But yeah, it's just kind of multifaceted, lots, lots of things happening. And for, for Alight and another acquisition we're thinking about, um, they actually had, Alight had some issues with their supply chain in that they, they had some debts there. And we weren't gonna assume that kind of thing. So before we bought the company, we, we said, hey, like, if we buy this company, can we actually produce product? And they had to go and re repair that relationship because they weren't going to get paid. And even with that kind of being taken care of when we bought the company, it actually settled that the company wasn't super willing to do that. Not, not they weren't giving us priority, basically. Like, like, they just, yeah, we'll make your stuff in like two years. So we had to diversify and find other manufacturers. And these, a -Light makes these like really, these really cool backpacking chairs um, made of aluminum and stuff, they're not easy to make. Um, and so finding the right suppliers taken more time than we thought. And we bought a -Light a year ago in f like February. We might not have product till like late summer. So unfortunately, so. Um, so every, every situation is unique. Another company we're talking to has a great product. They've got production going already. And if that one happens, it's just more augmenting what they're already doing. It's turnkey, it's just giving them more gunpowder and, and, and resources and stuff. So, so it just varies. You know, I think the most important thing is we're validating, we're validating the reason to exist, putting them through, do you, do you can, can you survive? Like, do you have reason to exist? And, and if you're not, ex not surviving, like why? And if we can solve those problems. Um, but every situation is unique. Another one we're looking at also has issues with their factory where they owe people money. And so are they pissed off? If you buy the company, can you even produce the product? They might not even want to ship you. So um, it just depends. Yeah. I respect entrepreneurs of every industry and ilk, but uh, folks like you that have to deal with uh, global economic supply chain issues, it just seems very painful. So congrats for uh, having thick enough skin to like keep plowing forward on that. Um, all right, let's open it up uh, to questions from the audience. If you just want to raise your hand, a microphone will be brought to you. It's always the first one who's scared right there. So what do you guys do? With how, do you how do you lower the risk when you're acquiring, acquiring a new brand or a company? What are the things you look at? How do you kind of take a new deal and say, oh, hey, this isn't too risky? You know, what's helped for, help me a lot was I, I um, got into like small and angel investing and just looking at like even like real estate stuff too. And you look at 100 deals, you start seeing like the winners and the losers and you look at P&L, you need to be comfortable looking at that kind of stuff and understanding like, like the costs, like what's off and what's not. So me and uh, Dale and Bruce, we got the P&L from Grand Trunk and we're like, redlining it, like, we don't need this, 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 and this. And then, the, and then when we realized, like, what they were spending money on and stuff like that and what we weren't going to spend money on, like, the picture starts becoming clearer. So if you cannot analyze the P&L, you're at risk because you don't understand the business. So we looked at hundreds of deals, like I've said, and I've looked at hundreds, including, like, real estate and stuff, and then you start 
getting a good foundation of like what is wrong and what is right. So that's, I guess, number one, like looking at that. And then just having experience. A lot of people um, jump into categories or industries they don't know anything about, and they think something's awesome, and they have no experience and it's really not awesome. Like, you know, what we see, even though we see a lot of gems in the outdoor industry out in that tent, you also see a lot of losers that think that they were the only one that come up with some widget online and then they find out like the 10 people have it. So um, just lack of experience. So we're very comfortable in outdoor. We know what's out there. We know what's been out there. We know what's unique and what's not unique from a, from like a product standpoint. That helps a ton to like avoid those pitfalls. And then one big advantage is just the shared resources, right? So we build up a team at Grand Trunk. We have, you know, solid fulfillment, building up marketing and sales and, you know, the accounting piece and all just, it makes it easier, right, to, to share. We have really good space to build into. Um, so, you know, initially with Grand Trunk, we kind of, we're at the base, right? And so now we have good resources that can, we can funnel a lot of these companies into. But if, if you're new to an industry, like ask someone that's in it and get some advice from a lot of people. Um, a lot, you know, I can't, can't stress that enough, like what we don't know because we haven't been there before and someone else already has made the mistake or been through it. I think that's one thing that um, one of my partners is really good at, super good networker, ask him a question, he just goes out and like asks 10 people about it and gets responses and then we have like a baseline. So if we didn't know, he clearly knows someone that does know and it kind of helps solve a lot of problems. So networking and asking questions that you don't know about. There's another hand up I saw right up here in the front. You both came from primarily online, right? And how, how, how has that been? Are you focusing mostly on retail or are you now leveraging both, right? Are you going online and in retail? And uh, the second part of that are, is like REI and these retailers, are they Really, is it hard to get a new product in there? It just seems like it would be really hard to get a new product in there as well. Yeah, you know, so I'd say we probably have both learned a lot about the B2B over the last year and a half. Um, so one, one thing we did, that we weren't in Dick's Sporting Goods before. We got, you know, in, into Dick's Sporting Goods. And one really good thing about Grand Trunk, it was kind of like Grand Trunk and this other brand that were known as Hammock, you know, the hammocks in retail. Um, so, yeah, to answer part of your question, like, Introducing, I mean, yeah, if you introduce a backpack or any other type of thing that you'd see, especially in like REI, incredibly difficult, right, to even have that discussion. Um, so it's kind of, you know, on 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 one hand, we're we're really leaning on and supporting our wholesale business, and we want that to grow, but attacking the direct to consumer as well, much much more and inside of that too, like kind of identifying our, our vision, right? And what, what we're trying to accomplish with like our, um, uh, you know, just our story that, that we want our customer to, to see and why they want to buy from us. And I've, I've uh, known a few people, more than a few, who have tried to do the direct to, or the, the retailer side of things. Spent tons of money going to shows and put a lot of resources in to get my product into REI or Dick's Sporting Goods and it hasn't worked when they should have focused on direct consumer. So that's flipped over the last 20 years. 20 years ago, you had to go to retail. There was no other channel for that. And then co companies like Cotopaxi, Buori, they didn't even think about retail. Once they demand was, was being driven online, the customers went to REI and said, hey, um, your customers are asking for Buori, you should stock it. REI doesn't need Buori. But Ari, but Vori is in REI. There was already 20 other outdoor brands there. So how does Vori and Cotopaxi get into REI? They created demand first of all, direct consumer, and then REI came asking for them. So um, I would say I would definitely, personally, would not start with wholesale. I would first start with validation through direct consumer, and then I would like go through um, you know wholesale as like icing on the cake, and then diversify channels in that point. But um, those retailers, a lot of them are just set in their ways and they're not interested in like new things. Um, and hammocks, by the way, that people aren't interested. Um, if they, they've been buying it for 20 years, they'll just keep buying the same thing. So um, from what I know, REI is looking for disruption. They've got you know, millions of members and they're all over the age of 40 and 50 years old. So they're looking for anything fresh and new. So just like in software or any type of um, you know, different categories, disruption. If you can be disruptive in an industry, 
that's what they're looking for. They're looking to, how do I engage the 20 to 25 to 30 year old versus um, the 50 year old? And brands like Eagle Creek and Ex Officio, those are 50 year old brands and they still look like it and they're struggling. Cotopaxi is a young new brand, Rory's a new brand, Allbirds, these guys, like, they're changing the narrative. Um, so look to those guys as like a recipe for like how to do it right today versus what was done like 15 years ago. We have time for one more. How do you balance what you're doing direct to consumer online versus what you're selling through retail channels? And making sure you're not being undercut on the value you're trying to create. Like your retailers say, hey, we'll sell these hammocks for 30 or $40 when you really want to be at that 50 or 60 price point. Yeah, the wild, wild west of like map pricing and stuff is kind of over in retail. Most established brands have kind of figured that piece out and Grand Trunk had, fin had figured it out. We're not opening up people that don't belong. So we understand that online is one channel, Amazon's a channel, and brick and mortar's a channel. So it's a pretty clean, cleaned up operation at this point. And all, all products, if we're a multi-channel brand, we're not doing different products in each channel. It's, it's one brand. Um, so we're not, like we have our map policy. We're not doing different pricing for different people. That's pretty standard within like the outdoor industry. I don't know if it's for other people, but outdoor industry, it's, it's Here's our, here's our line, and people, people buy from it. Grand Trunk was so heavy on the wholesale side that, yeah, I mean, the, the direct-to-consumer side, it wasn't, if there were issues, they were just really minimal. They were really strong wholesale, and, and then that's something we're trying to really build out, is that, that website and, you know, um, In the outdoor industry, it's, it's really, um, it's considered like a premium industry, like most of the brands in the industry are not discounting. So our guy doesn't want to buy things on sale and they don't want to put things on sale. You have this other ecosystem or channel on Amazon where it's the wild, wild west because people can sell whatever they want. So we don't ever want to compete with that even though we have to a little bit, but that's not a game that we ever want to like, play. So um, if you can make it in the outdoor industry as a premium brand and you, people buy your stuff because of your values, principles or merit, um, that's what, our customers are looking for, so we're not we're not playing the, the sale game really at this point. Very cool. All right. So for all the folks in the audience and the viewers that watch this later, what uh, Christmas present should people buy from Grand Trunk for their husband or wife or kids? You know, yeah. One thing. So I mean, everyone knows what a hammock is, right? So uh, we came out with a product called the the Rover. It's basically a, a chair hammock, so you sit upright in it. And we're trying to do, do a lot better story of, of, of showing. Because you can get a hammock and just throw it up and lounge somewhere, right? But yeah, it's, it's really good if it's upright a little more than a hammock in the perfect spot. If you have two trees that are a little far apart, you might hate it. But that's the story we're trying to, to clean up. But that's, that's a cool one because it's pretty unique, um, the, the Rover. Yeah. And I would probably buy a, our tech blanket. It's a thermoquilt. It's a hammock that, or it's a under quilt, over quilt, so you could wrap it around your hammock and use it like today in your backyard. And when, not, when you're not using it for that, it's just a blanket or a sleeping bag. It's 100 bucks, so it's approachable, it's easy. Um, probably the product I would I use more than anything because when it's not a hammock situation, I just, it's a blanket. So. And we have a number of cool shelters too that like fully encompass your dog could sleep on a a mat on the ground that's fully covered you and your hammock with the thermoquilt. Good camping setup. Very cool. Well, uh, I'll be your salesman of the hour. Cool. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Bruce. Appreciate you guys taking the time uh, to join us, and congrats on your success. Yeah, thank you thank very you. much. Our pleasure.